Good morning. It is so good to gather in all the places that we are gathering this morning. I love to see those of you who are waiting to bring in the light when I get up here. It always makes me smile. I'm Amelia Richardson Dress. I'm the Minister for Community Faith Formation here, and along with Reverend Sarah Verasco, uh, Parker, who is uh, choir and audio, <laughs> the rest of our AV team, we have several folks helping out today, and we are also welcoming Eric uh, on piano today. So thank you all for being here. It is good to be together. As we settle into this space and let the energy that arises for you, whatever that is, whether that is leftover grief from the week, whether that is leftover joy, whether that is excitement to be here, notice it and just let it come up. This is a space that can hold all of those things. And so we say together, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. And we stand and join in singing our hymn for bringing in the light, we are marching. the tradition of bringing in the light and the reminder that we all come the way that we come and that this is a place that really does welcome that. Our opening blessing this morning is going to be, this is a big church word, antiphonally done. That means that we have uh, the left and the right uh, speaking to each other. So this is the left side of the congregation. And this is the right side of the congregation. And you might consider just turning towards each other a little bit if you are here in the sanctuary. And if you are at home with multiple people, maybe you want to choose different parts to do. You may listen. You may read along as you feel moved. But we will join in doing this together. Please rise in body or in spirit and join us in prayer. I'll be leading the left side, and Eleanor will be leading the right side. Blessed are you who feel empty today. May you find inspiration. Blessed are you who grieve today. May you find comfort. Blessed are you who are fearful today. May you know God's peace. Blessed are you who have enough today. Enough joy, enough courage, enough food. May the, May the well, well of God's, God's care, care overflow in you, in you so, that so that others, others may have enough, enough too. too. Thank you. Okay. That's still on. The children uh, who would like to will be leaving for Children's Church now. They'll be in the back with Stephanie, who is uh, a gifted teacher, and will take them out for some time of reflection of their own. If they um, prefer to remain in the sanctuary, they are always welcome here in the sanctuary. And our next song as they are leaving is Jesus Loves Me. This is the traditional version, but as we practiced it last week with the camp version, we are going to try to incorporate that clapping again. On the chorus, it was Jesus Loves Me, clap, clap, clap. Okay, we will give it a try. Sarah will come up here and help me lead the clapping. <laughs> because she has practiced. 
<laughs> Please stand as we sing Jesus Loves Me. <laughs> remembering, uh, I don't know, a couple months ago, some of the kids for Spark, which is our elementary group, were here after worship, and one of the things that we did was practice using the microphone over there, and it turns out that one of the things they really practiced was telling jokes into the microphone, which at the time was hysterical, but I did not realize how practical of a skill that they were also <laughs> developing. We're turning to uh, reading today from Matthew, and we are continuing a series that we have started on the core teachings of Jesus and the Sermon on the Mount. The story so far goes like this. Once when Jesus was teaching, he began by blessing all of the people who had gathered. He said to them as he looked out on these crowds of people hungry to know more, Blessed are you who are poor, who grieve, who need justice. Blessed are you who are overlooked, and you who come seeking. And then some in the crowd began to wonder if they were good enough to receive this blessing. Jesus was a well-known rabbi. Was he blessing them? And others wondered what they were supposed to do with this blessing. Would it make a difference in their lives in any real way? And so as the murmurs began to spread through the crowd, Jesus heard their ponderings, and he said to them, You are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. Do not hide who you are, and do not let others tell you anything different. And then he began to teach. He talked about the prophets, about Moses, and about Abraham, and of Jacob, and Ruth, and Deborah. And he said to them, do not think that I have come to abolish the law. I have come to fulfill it. And then, saying this, he turned his attention to particular teachings from the scriptures that he knew so well. And one of the teachings that he gave went like this. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not swear falsely, but carry out the vows you have made to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let your word be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. 
There is a school of wisdom that says that if you really meant something, you would swear to it. And I think of our childhood ways of promising things, of cross my heart and hope to die, of pinky promising, even where the idea is that if you don't follow through, the other person can break your finger. And then there's swearing on your grave or on another person's grave. And when we put all of them together, they really kind of sound a little morbid, don't they? (laughs) There is really, though, this connection between the promises that we make and life and death. And that's a tradition that existed in the Bible as well. To take an oath was to invoke a curse or the wrath of God. It was a way of saying, I am going to be honest, and I am so honest that if I fail in this, God can strike me down. It's why one of the commandments that we have is, do not take the Lord's name in vain. In other words, don't get God involved if you are not sure that that is what you mean. And as we think about these teachings, that have come before Jesus, the ones that he knows and is drawing on, it's important to keep in mind the opening sentences that he starts with. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law. I have come to fulfill the law. We heard those last week in relationship to the prophets. When Jesus begins this set of teachings that we're exploring today and continuing on. We call them antithesis teachings, because each one starts with, you've heard it said, but I say. And Jesus isn't really saying the old rules don't matter. He's grounded in his own faith, and he's grounded in those teachings. But he is saying, let these rules get into your bones. See what the Spirit does as Reverend Sarah said last week. He might even be saying, don't follow these rules just for the sake of following them. Live by them and let them change you. And I think that's why sometimes we notice that the more vehemently someone promises something, the less we trusted it. Did you ever notice that a pinky promise had to be followed by a cross your heart, had to be sworn on by something? We know intuitively that if we need a plan to enforce something, we're not really very confident in that relationship. And maybe that's why Jesus is so forceful at the end there, that nothing good is behind this urge to swear on something. Just say what you mean and do what you say. There's a book called The Authenticity Project. It's a novel, and it's about this lonely older man who starts an experiment by leaving a notebook at a local coffee shop. On the first page of the notebook, he's written this. How well do you know the people who live near you? How well do they know you? Would you realize if they were in trouble or if they hadn't left their house for days? Everyone lies about their lives. What would happen if you shared the truth instead? He kicks off this experiment by writing his own story, and it's not just the version that everybody knows about how he was a famous artist with this wonderful life. It's another piece of it, about how lonely he is without his wife, about how every day feels empty. And then he invites whoever finds the notebook to write their own story and to leave it for someone else to find. That's the authenticity project. Jesus doesn't use the word authenticity in the passage that we have this morning, but he is getting at a similar idea. The point is to peel off the layers separating who we are from who we say we are. 
And we talk a lot about being authentic here at UCC Longmont. We want this to be a space where people can show up however they show up. And we talk about it even out in the world. It's a value that's becoming more common. That's been a bit of a necessary correction, I think, over these generations of valuing sort of that stiff upper lip where you never let on. I think of Luisa's song from Encanto where she says, I'm the strong one, I'm not nervous. I'm as tough as the crust of the earth is. And underneath you see through the animations this sense of building pressure as the song goes on. Under the surface, I feel the zerk as a tightrope walker in a three-ring circus. That's the gift of that movie that throughout everyone discovers that they matter more than what they can do. But you can't help but wonder as you watch it if they might have discovered it sooner and with a little less damage to their house and their relationships if more of them had said something earlier. Sometimes keeping our speech in line with our actions means letting people see the most vulnerable parts of ourselves. But there is also a bit of a dark side to authenticity sometimes. Authenticity goes wrong when it stops being about letting people know you and starts being about making people deal with you. You might know people who understand authenticity this way. They're the ones who will hurt someone's feelings under the guise of just telling it like it is. Or say something painful and then end it with, that's just my opinion. We're left to wonder in those interactions, when does living honestly or living by your word cross over into something damaging? When is it no longer a value? When I think of this and think of the idea of being as good as your word, the line that just resonates in my mind is from The Christmas Carol. At the very end of the book, after Scrooge has promised to do better, Dickens tells us Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all and infinitely more. And what makes this worth pondering today is that Scrooge was technically always as good as his word. There is no point in that story where you have any doubt about who Scrooge is. He's not deceiving anyone. But there is still something inspiring about this ending and about this idea of being as good as your word. The inspiration doesn't really come from the honesty. It comes from the fact that Scrooge is now trying to live well. And by living well, I mean living in meaningful relationship. His words are no longer just honest, they're sincere. There's something he is growing into. Throughout the biblical tradition, words matter. It's actually an understatement, as I say that to say today, to say that words matter. Words in the biblical tradition are at the very heart of existence. Creation starts with a word. The word of the Lord descends on the prophets. They don't just hear it, it comes to them. And Jesus is understood to be the word made human. Words for us have this power to create or destroy. And in the Bible, that is a literal power. That's why Jesus is concerned about oath-taking. And while we might not retain that same sense 
today, we still have this understanding that words shape our worlds and that they influence who we become and who others become. And so we know the power of our yeses and our noes. We know those resentments that build when we agree to something, knowing that we really can't take that on right now. We know the other side, being on that end of a broken agreement. That's what today's passage pulls us into. And it reminds us more than that, that it is worth figuring out the words that we want to live by and the words that we want to live up to. May your reflection continue this week and beyond. Jesus offers both words to live by and words to live up to. And this morning we're going to be sharing the version from Casa del Sol. So let's join together in this prayer. Ground of all being, mother of life, father of the universe, your name is sacred beyond speaking. May we know your presence. May your longings be our longings in heart and in action. May there be food for the human family today and for the whole earth community. Forgive us the falseness of what we have done as we forgive those who are untrue to us. Do not forsake us in our time of conflict, but lead us into new beginnings for the light of life, the vitality of life, and the glory of life are yours now and forever. Amen. This is 
in your black hymnal number 498, verses 1, 2, 3. It's also on our screen this morning. Uh, Sue Roach. I, uh, my pronouns are she and her, and don't be afraid of the sun. And we need to have lessons for the council on how to use microphones if they want <laughs> us to get up here. So, um, so I serve on the church council, and I'm pleased to welcome you all here this morning. A special welcome goes out to our visitors and guests. And if you'd like to learn more about our community, please take a moment to sign your name on the uh, clipboard on the back table in the back of the sanctuary. There's also a, clip a clipboard there for people who would like to uh, get a new name tag. Um, and if you're joining us online, please use the electronic fellowship pad found on the homepage of the website or email office at ucclongmont.org for more information. Immediately after the service today, we're going to have a congregational budget meeting. And you're all invited, invited to join. Um, you can attend here in the sanctuary or there is a Zoom link in the Weekly Happenings newsletter. UCC Longmont is collecting donations to help our neighbors who lost their homes and possessions in the Marshall Fire on December 30th. Please see the announcement and happenings or mission possible for uh, how you can make monetary contributions. Today is the last day for any uh, material goods that want to be donated. Please check the bulletin for uh, up-to-date information and uh, you can access the bulletin on our website homepage. If you'd like to support UCC Longmont financially, we'd be uh, very grateful, and you can give online at ucclongmont.org giving. Or in person, there are offering boxes in the back of the sanctuary where you can deposit your gifts. So we thank you very much for joining us today. We would appreciate anybody who'd like to attend the uh, congregational meeting to join us up front. And uh, we look forward to uh, discussing our uh, future financial um, ongoing presence here in the community. And I hope you all have a great day. Thank you. All right. So whether you are staying or whether you are departing, and wherever you're joining us from, I invite you to receive these words of blessing. Friends, life is a gift. And we haven't much time to gladden the hearts of those who make the journey with us. So be quick to love. Be quicker still to be kind. 
that the gift of your life may overflow as a blessing to others, and that they may know and have space to be exactly who they are, and to also be the one that God created them to be. People of love, people of compassion, and people of peace. May the peace of Christ be with you this moment and in all the moments to come. And may Christ's peace come to earth.